Open your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 on the uh, Pew Bible. It's on page 871. All the scripture and notes are also, as always, in the Version Bible app, um, along with devotions for this week for kids and adults. Um, you can always find those as well on Bible.com uh, later on this afternoon. Um, how many of you have ever played with Legos before? Anybody ever played with Legos? Some of you. Some of you are lying, but some of you. Um, when, uh, especially when you have little kids, uh, or maybe not, maybe you don't have kids and you just have Legos at your house, then good for you. Uh, but you all know the, the worst torture, it will probably be what hell is all about, Legos scattered on the floor and you walk through in the night in the dark uh, and you find them uh, there. Uh, but I don't know if you've seen Legos lately. Uh, they are very complicated, they are very convoluted, and I brought some today from my house. Um, you know, when you open up a Lego package today, you don't just get a little fold-out thing with five instructions on it. You get several books worth of instructions, each with like a hundred instructions, all to build one particular deal that's not near as big as you thought it would be uh, on the box. And you flip through there and, and you're trying to th decide, okay, this, you add three, four pieces there, two pieces there, one piece there, and it lists out all the pieces that go along just with this one instruction book. Not counting book two or the other one over here. Uh, and you try to get through them all and you try to find them and you say, okay, get to the next step. And then once you get to the next step, there's always that one piece you can't find. You know, you, you, you're searching through the bags, you're looking and you're trying to find them. Uh, you can find the guys easy. There's a guy, there's Batman. Okay, I can put Batman together. Um, but you can't find the other pieces. And uh, when you get to that one instruction where you can't find the piece, it's a little irritating. It's a little frustrating. You're sure, you're swearing that Lego made a mistake. And they intentionally leave one piece out of every box that they made. And then you find it later chewed up under the couch, either from your dog or your kid. Um, but... The thing about that, that that goes along with what we're talking about today is a lot of times um, in our lives, sometimes we feel like we don't have all the pieces. Maybe you're missing some marbles. I don't know about you, but uh, you, you feel sometimes like you don't have all of the pieces. You get to a certain point in life and you're thinking, I should be able to do X right now, but I don't have the resources. I don't have the money. I don't have the skills. I don't have whatever it is. Uh, fill in the blank. I don't have that to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Or you get to a certain place and you may be thinking, I don't know what the next step is. I'm on page, I'm on instruction 87, but I don't know what instruction 88 is. I'm just sitting here. I, I, I don't even know what the pieces are for the next step. I'm just waiting for the next step to happen, waiting for it to come. And in our lives, that does happen sometimes. We're waiting on God to give us the next step or we're waiting on God to give us the next set of pieces before we can move on. And when we get to that certain point and we don't know when God is going to show up and give us the next step, we don't know when we're going to have the next set of pieces we need to put together. We don't even know how many pieces we're going to need to put together, how much money we need, how much of whatever we need to accomplish what God's got for us to accomplish. It, 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 it's a little worrisome. It causes a little bit of anxiety in some of us from time to time. We, we are faced with a life situation and we don't know what to do with the pieces we've been given. And so we have to trust, we have to have faith, but at times even the faith does not seem enough to overpower the worry. And so that's what we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 12. You see, Jesus gives us some specific words about anxiety, about worry, and whether we acknowledge it or not, on some level, at some point throughout our lives, we all struggle with it. We all deal with it. Uh, either from something directly affecting us or something affecting somebody close to us. Uh, this is a teaching Jesus gives to his disciples. And so while this is applicable to all people, specifically this was given to Christians. Look at verse 22. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. So Jesus begins talking to them about needs that they have, food, uh, uh, clothing, 
um, needs that will cover all kinds of different issues in their lives, and he's going to expand that on in a moment, but he's specifically talking about physical needs that they have. Uh, don't be anxious about needing uh, uh, food or clothing or to get down to the base root. Don't be anxious about needing money to buy those things. Don't worry about it. Don't focus on it. Don't let it consume you. Verse 23, he says, life is more than food and the body more than clothing. He says, there's more important things going on uh, in this world, in your particular life, than those things, than needing money to buy food, than needing money to buy clothes. Yeah, those things are important, and God uh, uh, wants us to have those things. Even going back to the first people, uh, God gave Adam and Eve food, and then God gave Adam and Eve, uh, Adam and Eve clothes. Uh, And so God wants those things to be had. He knows we need those things. But he says we don't need to worry about those things. Verse 24, Jesus gives an example here of uh, not worrying. He says, Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more value are you than the birds? Now this example Jesus gives is very important uh, for a couple of reasons. Ravens in this particular day and time were thought to be worthless birds. They had zero purpose. Uh, they were, or were just uh, junk. They were trash birds. Nobody wanted anything to do with them, and they didn't know why God created uh, ravens. And so when Jesus says, even the ravens, think about them. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a job. They don't work for what they eat. They don't work for a living. They don't have a storehouse or a barn. They, don't have, they haven't thought far in advance. They're not planners. They didn't think about uh, gathering stuff up for the next day. They just think about the moment. And even these birds, God takes care of. Even these birds, worthless birds, God provides food for. So how much more will he provide food and, and needs for us, the pinnacle of his creation? You may be thinking, as, as many of us do, in the moment when we have desperate needs, it's easy to read the stuff on the page. It's harder to live out when you know the next day you've got that bill coming, you've got that medical thing, you, you know you're going to have to buy food, you know the rent's due, you know the mortgage is coming, you know the health issue that's going on, and you've got these things that are coming, and you say, I read that, don't be anxious, and I know he takes care of the ravens, and I know he's taken care of me in the past, but this thing is tomorrow, and I've got a, a lot of anxiety weighing down on me because I don't know what is going to happen. It's beyond my control. Look at what else he says. Verse 25. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Now this example is is almost comical. He says, if by worrying you cannot add an hour to your life, what point is it? If you're going to worry about, about all this, these little things, as he uh, calls them, uh, why worry about them if they won't benefit you, if they won't add an hour to your life? And trusting in God, the one who created your life, who has the ability to add an hour to your life, if he would so choose, why not trust in him instead of our own worry and our own cleverness to accomplish and satisfy our worry? And so Jesus says it makes more sense then to trust in God Instead of what is worrying us, verse 27, he says, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. So now, uh, we had, before we had an example of ravens, now he gives us the example of flowers in a field. He says, lilies in the field are pretty, they're beautiful, and that's beyond argument. They just are. And he says, even Solomon, the richest man who has ever lived, even with all of his money and all of the, the clothing and accoutrements that he had, did not even come close to the beauty of the lilies in the field. And he said, if just the lilies of the field, though, they would take, uh, when they needed to start a fire, or in this case, uh, a fire in the oven to cook, they would go out and they would grab a hunk full of grass and and flowers or whatever was there to use as uh, uh, fire starters, kindling in their oven. And they would would light that, and then they would light the, the wood after that. 
And he says, those things that only are beautiful for a day, uh, uh, God takes care of. God makes them beautiful. God uh, 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 properly provides everything those lilies need to grow and be beautiful. And he designed them that way. How much more will he not take care of you? So you acknowledge that those things are beautiful, but again, when we faced, when faced with our own issues and our own problems and the day-to-day things that go on with us, we still have a tendency to uh, angle towards worry from time to time. Look at verse, oh no, stop for a sec. The very last phrase there in verse 28 I find very interesting. That Jesus in his teaching, in talking to his disciples, right? His guys that have been following him, his guys who will be the foundation of the church when Jesus leaves. Uh, obviously, they're having an issue with worry and anxiety, or Jesus wouldn't have brought this up. But he, set, he calls them guys with little faith, you of little faith. What Jesus does there is he puts in direct opposition from each other uh, uh, worry and faith. By, calling, by, by telling these guys they have little faith, he is saying, if you are focused on the worry, if worry is taking up your time, then your faith is not. That you cannot have uh, explosive faith in Jesus and be consumed with worry. Because if you're worrying, then you're not focused on Jesus. You're focused on your problems, not on Jesus' provision for your problems. So Jesus puts these things Uh, on opposite sides of the field here. Now look at verse 29. It says, Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. And now Jesus, he's just a master at teaching what he does here, and using the same words begins to angle the argument towards where he wants to go. He says, Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. Don't pursue those things. Don't focus on those things. Don't let those things consume your thought processes day to day as you go about the worry of how you're going to pay for these things or how you're going to get these things or how you're going to achieve these things and accomplish these things. Don't worry about that stuff. It says don't. Just don't let it get there. That's a foothold for the enemy. That will tear you down. That will pull you away from where God intends you to be. He says, for all the nations of the world seek after those things. Those things that we worry about, that we think about, that's what people who don't know Jesus think about. That's what they allow to consume their minds, the people who don't have Jesus to lean on. He says, we should not be imitators of those people. We should be imitators of Jesus, relying on God, having faith in God, trusting in God to provide for what we need. Not depending on, on, on our own thought processes to get through the things and to, 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 to really focus on the worry. We need to let go of the worry and embrace the faith. Uh, he says, uh, the nations worry about those things. Your father knows that you need them. So by already saying that worrying is not having faith, and so having faith would mean not worrying, and if we have these needs that are coming up, these needs that are immediate, these needs that are about to present themselves, and he says, God knows that we need them. So it really comes down to, do we trust God to fulfill our needs? Because if we're focused on the worry, if we're worrying about those things, then we're not trusting in God to fulfill those needs and those problems or those issues. We don't trust that God will take care of them. You see, worry Basically, when you get down to the root of it, worry is kind of like a subconscious desire to micromanage God. A subconscious desire to micromanage God. We, we are out of our, those things are out of our control. We can't take care of them. Uh, they're just kind of out there. We want to take care of them. We want to do what we want to do. And so we're not trusting God in those moments. We would like to say, God, you need to do X, Y, and Z to accomplish these things and alleviate my worry so I don't have to deal with this. You need to do it my way. And then in those moments, we don't trust God. God's sovereignty, God's plan, God's provision, God's goodness. I mean, if God truly is good and he knows our needs and he has promised in Scripture to take care of our needs, why in the world do we worry about him? 
We're saying, I mean, we're worrying about something God promised to take care of. The entire scripture is filled with moment after moment, story after story of God fulfilling the needs and the promises he has made. And so if God knows we need something and he has promised to take care of our needs, we ought to trust in the fact that God will do what he says and take care of our needs. But sometimes we don't. He says we don't need to seek after those things. Let God do those things. That's his job description. That's his responsibility. This is what we're supposed to seek after. Verse 31. He says instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Seek his kingdom. Seek his purposes. Seek what he desires. Seek what he wants. Because the next verse, it says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to. God desires to. God would love to hand over the keys to the kingdom of his glory and his, his presence if we would simply seek it out. He says, you need to seek it out. God wants you to seek it out. He wants to give it to you. He wants you to experience the life he has designed you to experience. But if you're too busy worrying about what you think you need or how you think things need to be accomplished, then you're not focusing on God's designs and God's purposes for you, and you will end up missing what God has laid out there. You see, worry at its base meaning is fear. Worry is fear that accumulates. Worry is fear militant, released into our lives, and faith is hope that we have embraced. Or, or, or a better phrase, I know that's in your notes there, faith is hope embraced. It's almost, you need to mark out embraced. Um, you need to put faith is hope explosive. Faith is hope explosive. It's not something to sit idle. It's not something that you just experience and you're totally chill about. Faith in, in being the opposite of worry, then hope is the opposite of fear. It is explosive in our lives. It needs to change our attitudes. It needs to change our motivations. It needs to uh, uh, imbue us with joy. You know, if we are not consumed with joy but consumed with worry, then there's a problem with our spiritual relationship with God. We've got to shift our focus and focus on him because faith and hope is what will get us through this world and this life and into the arms of Jesus. Look at verse 32, uh, 33. He says, sell your possessions, give to the needy, Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So sell your possessions, give to the needy. He's not saying in that particular instance, sell everything you have so you have nothing and give away to people who don't have anything so then you will have nothing so other people can sell their stuff so they can take care of your needs. Uh, what he's saying is what they did later on in the book of Acts. If you see a need and you have within your capacity to take care of the need, take care of it. If that means sell something off so you have money to take care of the need, then do it. That's what they did in the book of Acts. When they had a need and somebody had a, had a plot of land or a lot of land, they would go and they would sell the lot, give the money to take care of the need, to take care of the issue. If you have it within, in your capacity to fulfill the need of a, 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 that you see and you don't do it, then you're living in sin. God didn't give us possessions and money and, 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 and capacity to shore up for ourselves. He gave it to us so we could provide for those around us so we could point all of them to Jesus. The whole reason we are alive and we have anything is to point people to Jesus. And if we're not doing it, we're not fulfilling our purpose. We're going to get to heaven and say, man, God, I accumulated a lot of stuff, man. I, I had this and that and the other thing. Uh, I may have told you all the story before, but there, is, there was a relative of Katie's who uh, was, had gotten to a certain age, and uh, they moved her out of her house because she, she, she couldn't take care of herself, and she moved in with um, a relative of hers, and uh, they sold her a house, and they put all of her stuff in storage because she didn't want to get rid of it. 
And she made them every single day drive her to that storage unit, and she would pull out a chair and sit there and stare at her stuff for hours. Stare at her stuff. How is that any different than what some of us do at our house? Just think about our stuff and have our stuff and use our stuff and don't think about how we can glorify God with what we have. Because if we're not glorifying God with what we have, why do we even have it? Why is it even there? He gave it to us and provided it for us so we could glorify him. And if that means we keep it and use it to glorify him, then great. Or if in this instance, as well as in the book of Acts, if that means we sell it and use it to glorify God, then great. But it needs to be used to glorify him and not ourselves, our own egos, or cover our worry with our plan instead of God's. It says, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches, no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we're accumulating stuff that prevents us from worry, then that is where our treasure is. That is where our focus is. And we will get to heaven using Paul's words from Corinthians, by the skin of our teeth, having done nothing for God here. We believed in Jesus and that got us there. And while we get to heaven and there's those around us who have great mansions and they have uh, 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 jewel-encrusted crowns that they cast at the feet of Jesus, we're standing there empty-handed with nothing to give him because we used all that we had here on this plane of existence, missing out what will be there because we're trying to cover the temporary worry we have here. I mean, this worry we have here isn't going to compare with the magnificence of what will be there. And so to focus on this is to miss that. And so we shouldn't allow worry to eat away at us and to mess us up and to get our focus off of where our treasure truly should be. It should be in heaven because all the things we have, all the things in our lives, our life itself, whether we live to be 120 or we live to be 42, doesn't matter as long as our life brings glory to God eternity awaits if we believe in Jesus bring glory to him I mean this life that we live here no matter how long it is no matter the length of the days it needs to bring him glory and then he will see fit to take us away from this place enter us into that great heaven and we will all live for eternity there But we just have this temporary time here to glorify him with our lives here. And so is your life glorifying to God in your worry? Jesus says no. He says if you're worrying, then you're not producing faith. Then you're not relying in the hope. You're relying in the worry. And that makes you worry more and more. And and that's not good for you spiritually or physically. I looked up a whole bunch of physical maladies that the medical community attributes to worry. Difficulty swallowing, dizziness, dry mouth, fast heartbeat, fatigue, headaches, inability to concentrate, irritability, muscle aches, muscle tension, nausea, immune system suppression, nervous energy, rapid breathing, shortness of breath, sweating, trembling, twitching, Digestive disorders, uh, short-term memory loss, premature coronary artery disease, and heart attack. All because people worry about stuff. So it's damaging to you physically. It's damaging to you spiritually. We have to recalibrate ourselves. You know, sometimes worry will hit you out of nowhere, and it comes on with a fury. You just can't see it coming sometimes. You can't control it. Sometimes it's just going to be there. And so you've got to, in the moment, recalibrate yourselves. I had to do that this week. There was a moment I got hit with worry. So I went in the other room, shut the door, got in with Scripture, read and prayed, recalibrated. Say, okay, my focus was in the wrong place. Shouldn't be on that thing. It needs to be over here. And I met with Jesus for a little while. Got back and all good. That's what we need to do. 
Say, man, I'm too busy to handle that, to go and lock myself in a closet. Get me a, get me a quick fix, all right? Uh, give me a quick five-minute podcast, and I'll, I'll hit that up, and I'll be all good for the next little bit. Give me John Piper or Louis Giglio or, or Adrian Rogers. Give me somebody. Just five minutes, just real quick, and that'll hit me, and I'll be good for the next 24 hours. But we don't need to rely on those things. We need to rely on the cure. We don't need to cover the symptoms. We need to get down to the root of the matter. Focus on Jesus. Don't allow worry to become what your life is about. Jesus has more important things for you than that. Worry is a tool of the enemy to get you sidetracked, get you off base from where Jesus wants you to go, from, from, to prevent you from influencing those Jesus wants you to influence. And so then we have to make the decision, am I going to be worrisome? Or am I going to be winsome, pointing people to Jesus, winning some to Jesus? You know, if you don't have Jesus, then you've got no hope. There's no way out of the worry if you don't have Jesus. There's no way out. You will be consumed by it. You will be overwhelmed by it. Even if you distract yourself enough to get away from the worry, it's not really gone because you don't have Jesus to to totally remove it. And you need him. You have to believe that Jesus is God's son. That he came to this earth and he died in your place on your behalf so all your sins would be forgiven. Then he rose from the dead so you could live after death. If you believe that, you get Jesus. You get access to the cure. You get access uh, uh, to God and his peace and his provision and, and his heaven. And a relationship with him that lasts from that moment on into eternity. Long past when you've died. But you've got to believe first. That's the only way to get access. That's the only way to gain eternity. You can't give enough money to get eternity. You can't do enough good things to get eternity. Uh, You can only believe in Jesus. That's the only way. Believe in Jesus. And then you get that relationship with God and the cure for what ails the human condition. But then for the rest of us, when we get hit in certain moments with that worry, and it may come out of nowhere and blindside us, or we may feel it coming on, we need to recalibrate ourselves and say, I need to, I'm focused on this thing, this, this thing, whether it's a money issue or a health issue or a money and a health issue of someone we know or another family member or, or, or it's, it's a work thing or a family thing or maybe it's all of it combined and it's just, just beating us down and weighing us down. We need to stop for a moment and say, where is my trust? Am I trusting in Jesus and his promises in Scripture? His promises to me and, or am I focused on these things? It's not a matter of a Lego piece missing or, or a, 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 an instruction, the next step not getting to us. Because the pieces of our lives and the next step, the next instruction comes from Jesus himself. So we have to rely on him to provide it. We have to rely on him to instruct us and direct us. So if you don't know Jesus, you need to know him. That's the only way you're going to get through this world and on into the next. And if you do know him and you're depending more on, on, or you're focused more on the worry than on the provision in Jesus, the faith in Jesus, the hope, the explosive hope, then you're missing out on the life he intended you to have. So you have to make a decision. If you don't know Jesus, your decision needs to be to come to know him today. Not to wait, not to have an argument with yourself in your head, not to say, you know what, I have made a decision with Jesus, but nobody knows about it. I'm going to be quiet. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm afraid to go down front. I want to wait until certain people are here to watch me do this thing. You need to make a decision. Are you going to obey Jesus or not? Come to believe in him. Come to show everyone, hey, I believe in Jesus. This is me believing in Jesus. Celebrate with me. and We will celebrate because it's a great thing. But if you do already believe in Jesus, your decision needs to be focus on him and not your worry. Don't let worry destroy you because it will. That's why the enemy designed it, to mess you up so it messes up God's plan for you. Don't let the enemy win. 
faith over worry, hope over fear. And that's what happens when you believe in Jesus and follow him.